A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior of the country and down to Ephesus where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They answered him, We have never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, How were you baptized? They, they replied, With the baptism of John. Paul then said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 men. He entered the synagogue for three months, debating boldly with persuasive arguments about the kingdom of God. Verbum Domini. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. God arises, his enemies are scattered, and those who ha hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so are they driven, as wa wax melts before the fire. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. But the just rejoice and exalt before God. They are glad and rejoice. Sing to God, chant praise to his name, whose name is the Lord. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. The father of orphans and the defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God gives a home to the forsaken. He leads forth prisoners to prosperity. Dominus Fabiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Gloria The disciples said to Jesus, Now you are talking plainly and not in any figure of speech. Now we realize that you know everything, and that you do not need to have anyone question you. Because of this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you believe now? Behold, the hour is coming and has arrived when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave me alone. But I am not alone because the Father is with me. 
I have told you this so that you might have peace in me. In the world, you will have trouble, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Verbum Domini. I first of all want to welcome our guest priests. It's good to have Father Ed Sylvia back on his feet again, although he's got a couple extra pieces of hardware <laughs> now carrying with him. Also welcome Father Luciano Chicchiorelli, who is from Rome. He is a member of the Montfort Fathers religious community, and he's doing some programs for our Spanish network on St. Louis de Montfort. So we pray for the success of your programs this week, as well as Father Ed's. One other, I want to also, also mention, because some have written, they've asked, well, how is Deacon Bill doing? How is Mother Angelica doing? And Deacon Bill has had some difficult uh, health problems recently, and thankfully he's, he's doing a little bit better. So please do continue to keep him in your prayers. Uh, Mother Angelica, although she wasn't able to attend the celebrations, the masses for their 50th anniversary uh, this past weekend, she did watch all of that on TV. So she continues to do well, um, and she continues to pray for all of you and for the network and for the success of, of this mission. In today's first reading, we had the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, <clears throat> and these people, these 12 men that Apollos and Paul encountered in Ephesus, which was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, they say, well, we never even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And do we ever act as if there is no Holy Spirit, that we are alone, the Lord's in today's gospel said, but I'm never alone. The Father's always with me. And we can also think about the Holy Spirit, that these days are days for us to especially invoke the Holy Spirit, to join Mary and the apostles as they had that first novena, those first nine days of prayer before the coming of the Holy Spirit. Wait and pray, the Lord had instructed the disciples, and so they did so. And so we're in this time between the ascension of the Lord and Pentecost Sunday, and it's a time when we especially want to invite and invoke the Holy Spirit. We want to know about the Holy Spirit, but even more so, it's more important to invoke him, to invoke his aid, to invoke him to come, that he will enlighten our minds with his, the light of his truth, that he will inflame our hearts with the fire of his love, that he will strengthen our wills for doing good. Because really our transformation is a work from the inside out. It's something that it begins with grace, continues with grace, and is completed by grace. And so how much we need to invite the Holy Spirit in these days to come. And we see in this first reading a distinction between the baptism of John, which was a baptism of repentance, and sacramental baptism. And so these, these 12 were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And also we see the sacrament of confirmation. Then Paul lays hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And so we see this distinction there in the early church. And I'd like to mention some of the fruits that are what takes place through our confirmation as I think all of us here have received uh, the sacrament of confirmation, and most of, most of the viewers who are Catholics have received that. Others are preparing for it. But let's think about what that brings about in our souls, what it is, and I especially wanted to emphasize the last effect that the Catechism talks about. But the first, it says the effect of the sacrament of confirmation that we received is a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. It increases and deepens up the baptismal grace we've received. So already at sacramental baptism, we received the Holy Spirit. But now through confirmation, there is an increase and a deepening of that baptismal grace. It roots us more deeply in divine filiation. We become even more so children of the Father that cry out, Abba, Father. And so even more so, we, we know this. We're, this relationship with the Lord is, is richer and deeper. It unites us more firmly to Christ. He is the anointed one, after all. That's what the word Christ means. And so we were anointed with chrism, a word that comes from the word Christ. And so we're more united with him through our confirmation. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect. And then the one I wanted to emphasize today, this final one, <clears throat> it gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ. So we are sent out as true witnesses of Christ to confess the name of Christ boldly and never to be ashamed of the cross. Let me read that again. It gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of Christ boldly and never to be ashamed of the cross. This past uh, Advent, Father Cantalamesa, the preacher of the papal household, gave a series of four talks on four waves of evangelization. And in this, he talked about how we can see in the history of the church that there's especially four waves. There's other events that took place, of course, during the course of these 2,000 years. But he points out especially four waves of evangelization, of bring, bringing the message of the gospel, of witnessing to Christ. And the first wave, he said, was in the first 300 years, the first three centuries, that we see the itinerant prophets and the bishops. The sixth to ninth centuries, we witness the evangelization of Europe after the barbarian invasions, which was especially the work of the monks. The 16th century, with the discovery and conversion of Christianity to Christianity of the peoples of the New World, where we are in the West, was the work above all of the friars. And now in the present age, and this is what I want to especially emphasize today, the present age, which sees the church committed to a re-evangelization of the secularized West, we need the participation, the decisive participation of the laity. This is the sleeping giant that the church has priests and religious, but that's a small percentage of the church. The vast majority of members of the church are the laity. And so what Father Cantalames is saying in this new evangelization that Pope Benedict has been talking about, he started this pontifical council for the promotion of the new evangelization to re-evangelize the secularized West, that the laity have a very prominent role to play in this. Not that the other, others don't, the friars, the monks, the bishops, and so on, but that this group now needs to be added and join to the others in this evangelization, this new evangelization in the present time. And I think one thing that we should keep in mind is, is a point that he brought out that 
historians will sometimes look at the history of the church and they'll say, you know, it was just kind of, because this happened and this happened, it was all kind of hanging on the edge whether or not Christianity would survive and continue. And just because this happened in Constantine's edict and all of these things, that's what brought about the prominence of Christianity. But it all kind of hung in the balance those first 300 years and many other times in history. But he brings about a point that's very important for us to remember in our own work of evangelization. You know, I planted for the first time this year a garden. I grew up on a farm, but I've been many years away since I left the farm at the age of 18. It's been many years. And so I wanted to try it to see what would happen since George's son had made us these nice garden beds. And uh, so it was really every day I go out there to see, did they grow? You know, how much did they grow? Planted these little seeds and now I got these huge pumpkin leaves and, and the corn is this high so it looks more like Iowa around here now. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's been uh, delightful really to see these small little seeds that were planted a couple of months ago and now to see them growing and developing and all this fruit that is hopefully going to be coming from that. Well, Father Cantalamesa points out that when the Lord described the kingdom of heaven, he described it like a farmer who goes out and he sows these seeds and he goes to sleep day and night, and he, but it grows. He doesn't know how it grows, it just grows. And so it is the same, you know, with, with the gospel, that we're to sow the seed, and some of my seeds didn't come up, but some of them did. We're to sow the seeds, but the growth really depends upon God. Paul said, I planted and Apollos watered, but God made it grow. And that's a very important point, that Christianity was not just kind of hanging in the balance. No, it's something that's a seed that the Lord has planted, and it's going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to grow, and it's for us then to be instruments of spreading that seed. Some of it may not come up, but some of it can grow and become strong and, and bear much fruit. Uh, Father Cantalamesa talked about a friend of his. I'll just quote his words on that, that point. He said the parable um, on the success of the Christian mission does not come from the exterior but from the interior. It's not the work of the sower, not even primarily of the earth, but of the seed. The seed cannot sow itself, and yet it germinates by itself. And having sown the seed, the sower can go to sleep because the life of the seed no longer depends on him. When this seed is the seed that falls to the earth and dies, that is Jesus Christ, nothing will be able to impede its bearing much fruit. That's the seed that's been sown, Jesus who falls to the earth and dies. Nothing's going to impair that bearing much fruit. One can give all the explanation one wishes for these fruits, but they will always remain superficial and will never reach the essential. The essential is that seed has a power on its own, the seed of the gospel. And what are we to sow? He says that we need to start at the beginning. We need to start at the beginning of this personal relationship with Jesus. That that's where it all starts. That if a person doesn't have this relationship with the Lord that they know him and then they have this deepening relationship with him. Have courage, the Lord said in today's gospel. You're going to have trouble, but I've overcome the world. And so as you come to know and to discover that, that your strength, your security is in him. And that's going to lead you to, to develop, that faith is going to develop, it's going to grow, it's going to become stronger. And so that's where it begins, too, in our own sowing the seed, the kerygma, the basic message that he said if he quoted the balm of Gilead, that spiritual, if you can't preach like Peter, if you can't pray like Paul, just go home and tell your neighbor he died to save us all. 
You know, it's just that basic message, that little message that Jesus died for love of you. And he invites you to, to know him and to have this relationship to him, inviting you to this life and communion with the Holy Trinity. He mentioned a, a layman in the United States that he knows. He says the father of a family who alongside his profession also carries on powerful evangelization. He is the kind of man who has a good sense of humor and evangelizes to the sound of loud laughter that can only happen with Americans. And when he goes to a new place, he begins by saying very seriously, 2,500 bishops gathered in Rome have asked me to come proclaim the gospel to you. People are, of course, intrigued. He then explains that 2,500 bishops are those who participated in the Second Vatican Council and wrote the decree on the apostolate of the laity, in which they exhort every Christian layperson to participate in the evangelizing mission of the church. He was perfectly correct when he said, they asked me. Those words are not blowing in the wind addressed to everyone, but no one in particular. They are personally addressed to every Catholic layperson. They asked me. The Lord ultimately asked me. The Holy Spirit who is within us ultimately is asking all of us to be a part of this new evangelization, whatever role the Lord asks us to play. This re-evangelization of the secularized West that all of us have one-on-one -on -one encounters that the Lord will bring about that we can in some way bring them closer to the Lord, that they can come to know him, that they can find courage in the troubles of their life because the Lord's overcome the world and they can find strength and security in him. So what is that the effect of confirmation that the catechism says? It gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of Christ boldly, and never to be ashamed of the cross. Come, Holy Spirit. This, is, this needs to be our prayer in these days before Pentecost and even beyond. Come, Holy Spirit, and enkindle in us the fire of your love.